very picky what I choose to work on. I think it look at something and think, well, is there a market already out there? Can I do it easily? Can I can I can I do it without without too much effort on my behalf? Can I do it easily without much effort on my behalf? That's such a great bit of advice for anybody who's looking to start up in business, um, wanting to do something other than work for an employer. If you're searching to start something on your own, this is just super advice. And Adrian has already started a number of businesses. He's only, I think, 25 now. Um, and it means that he's been able to you know, test the water on a number of different ways to see what it is that he really wants to be doing. Um, so definitely, I would call him a young entrepreneur starting in the world of business and having a go, but also looking at where he can make the most impact in terms of, and, and the least effort as well. A super interesting story, a super interesting interview. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Adrian. How are you today? I am exceedingly well. Oh, that's, that's a good one. I've not heard that one before. <laughs> Normally people say, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm great, but exceedingly well, that's brilliant. So um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We obviously met each other a number of times at Tech Wednesday in Birmingham, and um, that's how you've ended up on the podcast. So I'm really interested in hearing your story. Um, so I will start with a first question, Adrian, and that is, can you share a little bit about your personal life? So where were you born? A bit about your education? Um, you can share bits about your family, but you don't have to. Um, where you now live, where have you moved around on the planet? Um, yeah, let's start with that. Over to you. All right. Well, from the very beginning. Yeah. 30th of August, 1993, I believe it was a Monday, around 3 p.m. or 10 to 4 or 10 past 4, something lines of that. Right. I was born, oh yeah, as everyone else, in Bulgaria, Sofia, the capital. Mm. Um, and then grew up there, but then moved to Libya at six months of age for, uh, I think, a year or something like that. I don't remember at all. Parents moved over there for business mm. stuff, um, well, work stuff. Mother was English, father was Bulgarian. Oh, right. So realistically, a product of perestroika or, you know, the end of the communism system. And so in Libya for a, a little while, then back to Bulgaria ever so briefly. And then mum wants to live back in England. Mm. So when I come back to England in 96 or 97, August, one of the two, I can't remember. I think it was 97, not too sure. I'm living in England ever since then, you know, age three. And grew up majority of my life in England. I can speak a little Bulgarian. I can probably say 50 or so words. I can read one or two words. I can't write any any of it. But uh, I know a few other languages as well. Okay. That, that comes to that later on. Okay. And been living in England since 97 odd. 10 years in the East Midlands, in Ollerton, near Mansfield, not far from Sheffield, not far from Doncaster. <clears throat> I know it well. Ah. Uh, and uh, since 2007, lived in Wolverhampton. Um, parents got divorced in 2000. And then mum remarried and moved me and her and my three dogs at the time, three greyhounds, dark wow. brindle greyhounds, to Wolverhampton. We used to live in we used to live in different places. We used to live in Low Hill, then to, um, where is it, Graysley, no, in Blakenhall. And now live in uh, Claregate. So all over the all over the place. Um, in where? Claygate. Claygate. Wolverhampton. Yeah, oh, Claygate. Okay, never heard uh -huh. of it. Okay. That's all right. Next to Tetanol. I always say Tetanol. Everyone knows Tetanol. I don't know Tetanol spoke. either. That's all right. It's <laughs> it's almost like the Wolverhampton version of um, oh what's it called Kensington, South Kensington. Oh, very so nice. The, yeah, exactly the place to be. So I always like to say, not far from there, right, right on the corner from it. Right. Um. So moved a lot. I was, not too much, but a little bit. So in primary school, secondary school, 
not too much happened there. Mm. Usual stuff generally, adventure, fun, relax, no no care in the world, mm. not too worried about things. Almost atypical. And there's a few moments in life that were amazing. Two fa- summer 2006 was pretty awesome. Age like 12, 13, you know, Xbox Live for the first time. Great fun, mm. great life, not having to worry about too much. Playing online, meeting people all over the world in Hungary and Italy and uh, Ireland and beyond. Great fun. Wow. Um, and moving to Wolverhampton. And then I think when I first moved here, um, I think, say, anxiety or something lines of that hit me, struck me a lot, where it was like um, just because the first time, shortly after moving, I think six months, got burgled for the first time. Oh, no. And yes, yes. And, uh, that, and, and that, that, I never happened, that never happened to me before. Mm. So I always felt before then, like, if you were the last person to lock the door, you'd be the one ultimately responsible for that thing happening because you, you failed to lock the door or do security checks or something lines of that. Really? Efficiently. That's why I always felt. Not, <laughs> okay. not so much nowadays at all, but no. that's, that's what happened. And, and that incident occurred um, all the while at school and secondary school in St. Edmunds, if you, if you know the area. And then I always wanted to go into video games. I used to play a lot of video games, see Xbox Live and Xbox back in the day. Not so much yes. PlayStation or PS2 or PS1. A little bit of PS1 back in the real days, 97, 98, 99, but majority of the time Xbox. Yes. So for the majority of the life, I wanted to make video games. Right. So after college, after school, I went to college and learned about video games for two years. Then went to university for three in Staffordshire and learned all about it. And I have some ambition. I'm not in the video games industry anymore, but some ambition to go right back into it with a certain strategy and a certain angle and certain cryptocurrency technology and and think what's called freemium stuff like that. But that's another conversation. Mm. I wanted to go back into it. I have an, a, an idea. Yes. But um. Or, but I was always learning how to be like the cog behind behind the scenes, like the 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 artist, the the techie, the yes. people doing the stuff. I slowly realised through university, after say two thirds through it, I realized that I'm more of a leader, more of a guy in charge, a director, a producer, rather than behind the scenes. And rather, I think than that, doing, rather than doing the coding, you mean? Yeah, I, I struggle. Yeah. Coding, was, we're not good at that at all, really didn't like that. I tried no. what's called Unreal Script, a very technical language that's used for Unreal Engine 3, which is now more or less redundant because we've got Unreal 4. Um, so I tried that, tried mm. modeling, wasn't really that good at it. Tried, tried the texturing side of it, which is the actual making the colors. Kind of struggled at that. Animation did quite well at that, but um, I had to do a massive crash course in that at the end of university to try and get something in the video games industry, but really struggled at that. Well, not yeah. struggled, but wasn't as good as other people. Good, but not as good as other people in such a short space of time. And it's like, no. And then I found that when you're not distracted by schoolwork or homework or even work for other people, hmm. You, you are you 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 start to go into like your natural version of you. You you be I, I, certainly I was more curious and I was looking into things and discovering stuff and I wasn't distracted by commuting and 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 coursework and exams and all the rest or such like that. And I was able to learn what I wanted to learn out of my own pure interest rather than what I thought I wanted to do. Because when you're seventeen odd, seventeen, sixteen, fifteen or so. You do not know what you want to do with the rest of your life. So I think no. the decision to do university at 18 is way too early. Mm. And you spent at least one year traveling abroad, doing stuff, and or doing a job. And no matter how menial or degrading or dirty it is, you have to do something out there in the real world. Because once you've done those two things, ideally a year of each, then you can come back and say, I want to do X or Y or Z for the rest yes. of my life. You've got more of a grounded... Um, decision it's a more of a granted decision what we want to do and so i went straight into video games i wanted to do something creative yes i remember talking to the person who interviewed me for college back in oh what mid 2009 i guess um wanting to do something creative and i had a bit of a youtube channel i had like nothing of great value on there just basic video game stuff just recordings yes and i want to do something creative and, and that's that's echoed on today where it's like one thing i'm planning on doing in the near future is writing some fiction stories uh based on like terry pratchett or tolkien inspired from them and taking some writing styles of say uh rolling 
and seeing what the hell happens. Mm. Um, so just be curious, but it's low priority at the moment. Yes. But but video games, love to do that and played a lot. But two thirds through university, realized I'm more of a leader. So when university was over in 2014, July, I just started to learn more things. So my bio, it talks about Coursera, which is an amazing site. You could learn, not for sure about these days, but probably still to, the, to some extent, learn university courses for free mm. to their standard, like university lecturers and just videos, really, and tests for free online. Some at your own pace, some like certain videos a week, but you can learn online for free, which is, as a side note, a lot of the stuff in this world, information and knowledge, is all out there for free online in some some fashion or some way. Yes. So things like university are almost education as well. Is mm. edu- university is uh, almost redundant, so to speak. In some aspects, it's not, or not certainly not, abso- not not obsolete either. But in some, some regards, education totally revolutionised, totally changed because. It's all out there. It's all online. And you can go to these places or you can go to these museums. You ain't got to be in a classroom to learn this. Or if you want to learn a language, you just go to the country. Yes. Communication and money and all the rest is mm. it's a completely different ball game compared to, say, 20, 10, 20, 30, 40 odd years ago. You can, all these things you can do online for free. Yes. For free. In your own mm. time. Very mm. powerful. So, finished university. Started learning curious things. I, I st- at first, I learned about the American Constitution. I thought this sounds interesting. Let's learn more about that. The American, did, the uh, USA Constitution. Yeah, yeah. I was just very curious about it. At the time, there was a lot of talk about uh, the First and Second Amendment. So I was like, oh, what is that? Let's learn about it. So I just did a course, like eight weeks on it, back in October 2014. Let's see what it's all about. Just learned a few things. Like, oh, just general knowledge, just general awareness. Being what's called a renaissance man, being able to talk about all sorts of topics quite easily and just general knowledge. And and then just did loads of crash courses on economics and finance and marketing and business and entrepreneurship. And it's like, well, that's interesting stuff, economics. Macro and microeconomics, because economics is major, so you might as well major in economics. It's important how the world works and revolves. So if you understand money and psychology, especially psychology, if you understand how people function and work, then you understand a lot about the world and, and incentives and why people do things and how to operate in business or or government and freedom and liberty and beyond. So if you understand how people think, then that's a massive advantage in life. So I learned about these things. Um, and then in the March 2000, was it 15 or 16? I think, I think it was 16. I was at a conference in London, and they were saying the benefits of writing a book. And I was like, well, of course, it makes logical sense. Let's write a book. So age 22, or 23, October 2016, so 23, wrote the first book, 50 Cognitive Biases for an Unfair Advantage in Entrepreneurship. Hell of a title. Took me, mm. ages, to figure out. Took me mm. ages to figure out what the hell to call it. And mm. it's like, I was thinking this, thinking that, and I eventually settled on that. Way too long, but shows you precisely what's going to be in the tin. And it's like, well, writing a book is awesome. How many people have written a book? You can incorporate this into your business model. Wow, so much opportunity. Yes. And it's a nice little asset to generate cash flow. So I wrote a book and uh, started a few businesses. First business was November 2014 with uh, e-commerce selling video games. It's a third-party retailer. There's a platform called Steam. You can download the games and play it on the platform. You, 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 you download it onto your own computer, and you can play it. So I thought, well, let's, let's have a website that sells these games, like a little key, a little series of numbers and letters that you copy and paste into the platform in a certain, certain settings, and you get yes. the game. Yes. But you got it through a third party rather than through them. So sure. let's, try and, let's try and sell that. Found a supplier in um, Cyprus? Was it Corfu? No, it was Cyprus. And... Um, uh, I went nowhere with that. Expanded comfort zone a lot. I used mm. to do these little free competitions every Friday, and um, I tried. I, tr- I, tr- I, I just didn't know how to get traffic over there. And now I realise Facebook adverts, but I tried Google adverts, and um, I tried doing these little revenue deals with like YouTube channels to try and get people traffic and customers. I made a couple of sales, like twenty pounds worth of sales, something negligible like that. Went really nowhere, but a lot, a lot, and expanded comfort zone. And, mm. and in hindsight, now expanding comfort zone is incredibly important because it's a tenacity. It's like there's two things important in life: 
You can do whatever you want. I say that there are a billion ways to make a million quid, and there are a million ways to make a billion quid. Right. But I also say you can do whatever the hell you want. Everything makes money. Ten pounds, ten pound note, for example. But it's how you got there. It's how the process. Mm. So you could say you can do whatever the hell you want as long as you're happy and competent. Mm. If you're not happy, then you get stressed out, you get tired, you don't want to do this, you know, not happy, not enjoying yourself. It's like, mm. ugh, yeah, no thanks. If you're not competent, you're not going to get the, the fruit of your labor. Mm. You're going to essentially waste your time. You're not going to be seeing the result from all this effort you put in. Yes. And it's a combination of both, happy and competent. And, and, and that's a case of exploring, experimenting, experiencing different things in the world, yes. podcasting, book writing, business, um, entrepreneurship, consulting, whatever the hell. Just try everything. You'll find that one thing eventually. Yeah, and it's sorry, I'm going to just interrupt you just slightly there. I've never heard anybody mention those two together. Um, so people say, um, and, I, and I saw a post the other day, day by Gary Vaynerchuk or whatever his name is, um, Gary V, they call him now. But um, And he said, um, that thing that you do, that you love doing, and you enjoy and it gives you a buzz or whatever just go and do that right mm -hmm. but no one's ever said the bit that you've said which i think is quite important to highlight here because after all this podcast is aimed at you know people that are bored in work in a job just over broke and you know, they, they want to do something on their own but they haven't got the courage to do so and by listening to people like yourself then they may get inspired and want to do something. So coming back to the point that you just made, it's that word competent, I think. I love that distinction to say, be happy what you do, but also be competent at what you do. Because the two are connected, aren't they? Because if you're not competent at something, you're not going to be happy either. Nor will it be, nor will it be profitable. Mm. Well, that... So is that important too? Because if you're happy and you're competent at doing what you're doing, but it's not necessarily profitable because, you know, we're as human beings, we're impatient, right? We want it to be profitable uh, like this. We want right. immediate results. And if we don't get immediate results, we give up. Nah. Unfortunately, and this, this is like the monkey brain versus the, like, the, the main, the, the most recent evolved part of the brain speaking, where we want it now, we want it now, nah, but you got to wait. One thing I learned is to be impatiently patient. Be impatient to start. Be get ready, get started. Go, go, go. Green light, go. But once you have started, you have to wait. Be patient. Mm. Relax. Take a step back. Ah, things take time. Be impatient to plant that tree. But hang about. That tree will take its time to grow. Yes. Yeah. And you know that old saying where the, the, second, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Well, let's say hypothetically, you start that, hypothetically, plant that tree 10, 5, 1 year ago, 1 week ago, 1 day ago, 1 hour ago. I don't know. You pick a time frame. Yeah. And um, you, bene you reap the benefits now. Like I was doing some doing a bit of maths on some stocks out there with regards to dividends and some of them pay monthly some of them pay quarterly well had you bought x amount a year ago you would be in a much better situation today compared to uh compared to one year ago or compared to two years ago yeah. and there's there's also that saying as well where um entrepreneurs entrepreneurs start out underpaid but over time they become overpaid and general people at work whatever field or such like if they're not happy and competent competent already start off overpaid but then end up underpaid mm. they start off overpaid in terms of i've got a job yeah by x y z abc can do this do that but then over time the day-to-day -day life grinds in it all, 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 all the stress starts to appear and the cracks start to show and it's like oh this is i'm not i'm underpaid for this not fun um this is too hard than i thought there was a job i used to have a couple of years ago I used to commute 60 mi six, 120 miles a day from mm. Wolverhampton to Manchester, M6 North, there and back again. It was like 
four hours round trip, I believe, for uh, QA testing on a video game in a video game studio. Eight eight hours playing video games, um, testing and jumping to Excel sheets and all sorts of you know binary options and saying this a mistake here, this error there, and not fun. Start off overpaid, then over time underpaid, underappreciated as well. Come to think of it, but entrepreneurship, you stick to it. Have a plan, which is vital, important, and a goal, a mission, destination, a journey. You pick a word, and you'll find it. You make money out of it. As I said, there are a billion ways to make a million quid. <laughs> you won't believe how profitable waste disposable is. Mm. You won't believe how profitable anaerobic respiration is either. Yeah, what are those? Google them. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I did that little thing with the games industry. Yes. Um. Uh, but then, so that I had that, had that video e- e-commerce store, and at the time I had these two prevailing beliefs as well. Because you mentioned people at work, people in you know jobs, there were these beliefs I had that were quite prevalent back then. Now they're all but destroyed. The first one was when I started the first business that I was struggling to make money, and it's like how 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 do you rationalise that emotionally? Not rationally, you know. Logically, but emotionally, the emotional, emotional part of the brain, rationalize it by saying, well, I'm not allowed to make money. I can't make money because I'm not allowed. I wasn't given permission. Mm. But realistically, you give yourself permission. But you give yourself permission by seeing success, by striving and achieving and doing and being patient, being impatient and patient, being figuring out plans and doing and achieving stuff. And also through osmosis and working with mentors and being with people who would be embarrassed by not making anything or, or not achieving anything in X amount of time or doing X things or subjects or stuff like that. Yes. Another thing I felt was, um, was oh, maybe I'm cursed. Maybe I'm just cursed. <laughs> and that was really just the emotional brain saying that it's all out of my control. I can't make money because it's all out of my control. Therefore, I can't do anything. And if I can't do anything, might as well give up now. Mm. But that's the emotional side. The, the logical side The rational side is always then saying, well, no, just learn from your mistakes, relax, reset your emotions over the course of a weekend, take take a step back and come at it again with a new strategy, new ideas, new tactics, new plans. The way I see it is like a woodpecker that's trying to peck into a tree, for example, or, or like you've got this nut, you're trying to break into the coconut or a walnut. And if you keep at the problem, trying different tools, different methods, different angles of approach, you'll eventually crack it and get inside the coconut, or get inside the walnut, or the, or the woodpecker will eventually break through. Mm. That's the way I always see it. Just change strategy, change angle, do something different. There's that saying by Einstein, you know, um, definition of insanity. No, no, not that one. Um, you can't solve a problem with the same mindset that created it. Mm. And that always stuck with me over the years and years. Like, exactly. If something's not working, change your plan, change your strategy, pivot. Um, do something different. Yeah. And that's very important in terms of rationalizing and looking at your situation rationally rather than emotionally and, and panicking, really. Um, and I, I tend to find that success just generally happens. You know, you, when you work towards something, you strive towards it, you get there over time. That's where, that's where the patient bit comes into it. Have your plan. Have your plan of attack. Know what you t- know what to do on a, day, on a day-to-day basis and the goals and other things you can think of easily. And just be patient. You'll get mm-hmm. there eventually. Mm. Think you that tree? Ah, it'll get there eventually. It'll, it'll, it'll sort itself out. And so right. I had that first business with minimal success. Twenty quid, prob- twenty pounds, or probably I don't know turnover or profit, something like that. It was not much, but it really expanded the comfort zone, learned a lot of things, and really changed a lot. And after that, I had this book actually right here. I bought this book from um, Waterstones called Contagious. How to Build Word of Mouth in the Digital Age by Jonah Berger. Very good book, to say the least. And I read it in record time from the 31st of July, 2015, until 11th of August, 2015. It's a record time of the day, back in the day. Yes. And <laughs> that book was all about creating, creating word of, doing marketing in terms of leveraging people and society mm-hmm. from a psychological point of view and using say natural behavior and the way ideas spread and like advanced viral marketing strategies like this this one that i call the trojan horse idea where if the name of something or the the product or the name of a product or an event is somehow embedded 
into the day-to-day language of what people say naturally because we're all like shortcuts who so think of the simplest words um then you're then you can tag along for the ride so i then started another business which is eventually called potato in the post and selling messages on potatoes in the post mm. so the idea behind that was in terms of trojan horse in this book jumping ahead a little bit is that um when people say when they get a potato in the post and they're talking about it online or to their friends or in the pub they're going to say something in the lines of you won't believe what happened to me i got a potato in the <laughs> post <laughs> exactly <laughs> Oh, I love it. Exactly. So I, re- I read this book, and then shortly after coming back, because I was on holiday at the time, and then I come back to the UK, and on Facebook there was this, there was a, in the feeds there was this thing about this guy in America, I had a potato business, and it was going viral, making the rounds and all that usual stuff. And I thought, hang on a minute, I can apply some of the principles I learned in this book, mm. that business, and I can do that and better for the uk and the key word there is for like to serve because mm. entrepreneurship is about solving problems yes connecting the dots ah hmm oh and then solving a problem ah ah hmm cha-ching solving a problem and that's why i saw it as i could do this and better for the uk mm-hmm. uh, the problem at the time was just making people laugh and just it was comical and it's not a grand problem the bigger the problem the bigger the problem you solve with, the more money you're going to make instinctively because the bigger the problem, people are more willing to pay right. for it to be solved, which is a little caveat there. Um, so so, I what, pro- that business. so yeah? what problem were you solving with the potato? Oh, just comical, making Com- people laugh, something okay. unusual. My cat, my, my thing at the time was I'd say, everyone knows that cards are boring. Yes. So send a potato in the post instead. There are two kinds of people in the world, boring kinds and fun kinds of people. Which right. one are you? Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So it's making people laugh yes. in a way. But you don't instinctively need to start a business with a problem in mind to solve. You, you can just do activities, for example, and trade, trade stock exchange, just money exchange and money, moving money around, which is a little, little, little conversation for later on. Yes, okay. Um, so I had the potato thing. And this is early August. I was going around to say Aldi, one of the places, looking at potatoes, the tape measure, looking at the size of my letterbox compared to potatoes there thinking, would this potato fit for a letterbox? Majority of them wouldn't. So I was like, damn. And on, by pure coincidence, on the, as I was leaving Aldi, there was a postman on the other side of the road. And I asked him some questions about letterboxes. And something like, would would a potato fit for a letterbox? Something like that. <laughs> and he was totally fuzz- totally confused and you know puzzled about this. And I thought, of course he's puzzled, mate. Just, just please answer the question. And I, I can't remember what came about that, but... Um, what he said or something like that but it was generally inconclusive but mm. i realized that if i had a box and the box had certain dimensions that the post office would allow a second class um small parcel mm. then i could put any, almost any size potato inside it mm-hmm. and then that box would be delivered as usual because royal mail would not allow potatoes in general to go through the postal system right uh, and i used to in the early days i had small potatoes in envelopes and that was very flimsy, not very fun at all. That was no, no, not not good. Instead, we had a box, like the size of a can of Coke, hmm. and inside there was a potato, a little piece of paper wrapped around it with a call to action and usual stuff on the website, and a little bit of context, just to explain, and then loads of shredded paper and wrapping paper inside that to cushion it. Yeah. So that's taped with the address on top, and that was a little package. Yeah. So I was literally selling potatoes with messages like happy birthday or you're evicted or I love you on a potato in the post instead of a card. Mm. And we launched, I had the idea mid-August and I wanted to launch by mid-September, but I was delayed until the end of September. And to me, see, impatient, impatient to get started. Go, go, go. Mm. But now if you started, be patient. Calm down. Think things through. What am I doing wrong? What am I doing right? How can I change my t- copyright? What if I change my pricing? What if I do this differently? What if I do that differently? Hmm. Hmm. So I had it initially giving loads of samples out for free. Like I would go to networking events and say, I do this. I'll do one for free. Who do you want to send it to? Give me their address. Give me the message and I'll send it as soon as possible. And initially I sent out loads of free potatoes across the UK to ran, random addresses, <laughs> random addresses. And, and one, one, one I did, 
was um, one of my scent potato too was the old house I used to live in in Ollerton. I don't know what happened. No idea, but I just did it. It was, like, it was fun. It was like it's like it's like echo to the past, like oh, you know, right. like thinking fourth dimensionally, which is t- time and space, but in, in different times, different events, like same place ten ten years later, so to speak. I just sent it over there, just a little just a little homage to my past, that sort of just a bit of history. Oh, you just give to- you just giving me an idea. I'll have to send a card to my my younger self in, uh-huh. the, in the house oh, yeah. that I lived in 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 Amsterdam. <laughs> Where yeah. I was born, there's, um, I have to send a there, message there. Why not? There's um, <laughs> there's an email service. I forgot what it's called. Where you can send an email to yourself in the future. You can write it out, and you can schedule it to be sent on a certain date. And now think about it. Every June, I have the email sent to me. It's like from the past, Adrian of 2017 or 2018. Now would have sent an email to me in 2019 saying. This is what I'm doing, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. How's what's happened? How's this? How's that? It's the way of looking back and reflecting over the past achievements that's important and recognizing what you have achieved and recognizing how much process and uh, progress you've made and the process you've gone through. Mm. So that's just an interesting little, little psychological thing to understand your journey and just bring it all back down. I've done this. This is the path. That's the goal. My ambitions back then, my goals back then, what's changed? Hmm. Yeah. So a bit of a homage to the past. Sure. Sent it to a random address. There's one person sent an email saying, oh, this is an awesome idea. Um, and then uh, an event in Birmingham. And, I, and this person I gave it, he wanted, he was his girlfriend's birthday. He wanted a potato. I sent a potato. She posted on Instagram goes a bit viral. And then next a few days after that, I get the strange email on the um on the potato website and it's like this order ID and I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Is that the webmaster messing around or something? What does that mean? What's this? And it's like I click into it. Someone bought a potato. And I'm like, hang on, actual order? Someone actually bought a potato? <laughs> so that's what it looks like. And I'm like, oh wow, let's get started. <laughs> and there were so many errors on the address system, the way it was laid out, and it was like, well that's awesome proof of concept here's mm. what i need to iron out mm. cool let's do more did it all did all the orders sent them all out and the rest was history um and then get in touch with some journalist and they then you know, share the story and talk about it the success and the journey and they share it online it gets all over the place i remember someone i know from in- indonesia saying it's in chinese and it's all over the place it's in bulgaria in the article it's been shared Wow! I was, onto the, I, I was invited, but I didn't quite get onto the BBC Radio Two because because they approached me directly. But then I, I under my contract, I had to send them to the agency. I couldn't do it myself. Right. And so they the agency wanted BBC to pay them, and they were willing to do that. So I didn't get on. But I got on a few. Uh, got onto a few other places. Yeah. Uh, Metro. I think what was it? I got the newspapers here. It's in the Metro. Hmm. And one or two at the Sun, and another one, I think Daily Express. I can't remember. I got them all here, but they're you know, they're in a pile. And um, so it was all it was all over the place, and like, um, a nice bit of storm. And I got a bit of hate as well, which is very important as well. Yeah, hate from some jealous people saying oh, I do this and do that, and I don't make as much money. And uh, one person also ordered a potato from my old workplace, and one place the place in Manchester. And uh, ah, that was interesting. They're just sending it up there. So I have some chips on me. Just a potato to the work to the workplace, and it's like, well, that's what I mean by looking back at the past. While I was talking about earlier, saying, look, look how far we've come. That that patience, that drive, that goal, keep going along that track, because now you want to go from here. Now you want to go up here. Mm. So keep going, keep striving, keep pushing, keep learning, keep figuring out what I'm doing wrong, and then think, what can I do better? So I have that business, and that's two thousand and. Um, late 15. So I have that. And then I write a book in 2016. I try other things. I pivot a little bit, try to sell some t-shirts briefly in April, 2016. That went nowhere. Look a few things there, try different things. I wrote a book, then another book a year ago, back in October, 2017. And now it's just like moving onwards and upwards. Uh, okay. Now, so, so can yeah. I ask a question? Sure. Sure. About the potato business. Is that, yeah. is that finished now? Is that yeah, that's right. Stop trading. Certainly, certainly, I stopped trading in January 2018. Okay. Uh, just moving on to bigger things. 
learnt a lot, done a lot. There was a few of the competitors back in the early days, and they made a lot of money, and then they just stopped, moved on to other stuff. There was one, there was two brothers, I believe, somewhere that wanted me to buy their business. That they were doing, they were doing, they were doing something like law or something at university, and they just tried it as a joke, and then they just wanted to move on, hmm. um, things like that, and just move on in life, do bigger and better things. It's like learnt a lot, achieved a lot. Oh, cool. Let's so not, what- so if you were able to take something away from the experience of running that business, I mean, that, that was your first business, correct? Arguably or, second. 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 So the yeah. software was the first one, but that didn't last very long. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the gaming, was that the first one? That's right. Yeah, and then the potato uh, business. So what... What what did you take away from from that business? What was the one big message, apart from the message on the potato? <laughs> the, you know what? There's there's a market. There is a market for everything. Um, this alludes back to what I said about there's a billion ways to make a million quid. Mm. You can monetize anything, really. You can monetize tissues, socks. Uh, what, what else you got around here? Bags, bookmarks, mm. frames. Mm. Anything can be sold. There's a market. There's a where, where there's a buyer. There's there's a seller. And if there's no buyer, then it means there's no market for it. Mm. So you have to explore, experiment, and experience. Explore different things. Explore different places. Different different people as well. See who who is see who's out there. Mm. Experiment, test different prices, different copyright, different. Angles, different layout, everything, and experience. See what happens. One thing I wanted to try about then was Facebook adverts, but uh, I struggled at it because I think that the market, and this this is what I talk about the buyers and sellers, that the the the, the product for sale was too new, too weird, too unusual mm. for any established what's called total addressable market TAM in terms of finance, where it was too small that people look at this and think, what the hell? And the, the first exposure, what the hell? I've never heard of that before. Who would do that? No mm. way. No, no, no. Mm. The second time they see it, I think, what? People actually do that? What? What? And it'd be the third, fourth, fifth exposure in some fashion, audible or visual or whatever, that actually consider buying it. So in some regards, I think I was too new to the market. And the total addressable market, which is important, how many buyers are out there, how much money is flowing in certain sector, certain sectors, uh, was too small. It was too niche, too unusual. Right. Got you. So, so you have to change. This is a go back to that thing I said earlier. To solve a problem, you need a different mindset. Mm. So I was thinking, okay, how can, how can I take it to the next level? What am I doing wrong? How can I tweak this? How can I make more profit here? How, how can I refine this? Explore, experiment, experience. Tweak and change and adapt and change. That's probably some of the biggest things I learned there. And the explore and experiment pivot and change and tweak and how big the addressable market was yes wow so moved on yeah so moved on from there and now looking to start something in hemp uh with terms of cannabis in terms of the crop right uh, as, well as, as well as something with bitcoin as well with with a business partner we'll, we'll see what happens we'll compare the two and uh we'll, i can do both of course but we'll see in the short to medium term um so a couple of years ago probably 14, 2015 odd, I hear about hemp in general. And I think it's so underutilized, so under, such, a, such an underdog. I thought, that's awesome. That's cool. I, sh- I could do something with that. I could. Note the word could. I had this idea back in the day for like engineering and like biofuel and hydroponics and like these massive farms growing hemp in these like hydroponic farms with like massive greenhouse, you know, massive you know, greenhouses with glass planes everywhere, all that kind of stuff. And I thought, I know nothing about bioengineering, nothing about engineering, nothing about, well, growing agriculture, things like that. There's no, I, what can I do? So it's like, well, okay, I'll, I'll leave it on the back burner. And then about a year ago, I tried something in e-commerce selling uh, um, um, T-shirts and other clothes that advocate hemp. Went nowhere with it, nowhere, because um, I chose two to a niche product. And I should have. Ch- and I, my strategy was very much like content marketing, which is like an exponential kind of way of getting traffic to the website. Where making videos and content articles, and getting SEO and sharing it on Facebook pages and all that kind of stuff, in the hopes that people would click onto the website and hope that they would buy something. Uh, interesting strategy, but didn't, didn't go anywhere with that. 
because before that, I turned that want that I could do this into I need to do this. I want to do it. And I'm going to do this. I just changed, literally just changed my words from I could, eh, I could, mm. into I need to do this. I am going to do this. And I did do it. And it went nowhere. But the content I created is arguably still out there. The YouTube channel is still around. And um, um, a couple of months ago, July? August ish, probably June, not too sure. 2018. So, friend request from India. This person represents loads of farmers. They're sorting out the legal over, legal paperwork over there. I know nothing. The legals. And once that's all sorted, I got a supplier of hemp, a crop, farmers for industrial, pharmaceutical, for construction, for fabrics, for clothing, for food, you know, factories in the UK. So, as an entrepreneur, I connected the dots thinking there's a farmer here. I, I'm sure I can find factories in England, cold calling, emails, company's house, whatever. I can find them. Mm -hmm. um, connect with them and then say, do you need hemp? Oh, I got a farmer. I connect the dots. Solving a problem. Factories yeah. need supplies. The, f the farmer needs customers. Perfect. I'm the broker. I'm the guy in the middle. Um, so looking to start that. And at the same time, a, a good friend of mine, a good business partner of mine, had something a couple of years ago in Bitcoin. I went all over the place with it and getting back into it. And it's like, well, we can do it. We can, we can work together on that. So we'll get started on that and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens in both. Um, and then explore, experiment, experience in each, pivot, tweak, learn from mistakes. And, and, and both can work. Could do both at the same time. But you want to focus, really. Follow one course until success. But if one is, one is running itself, then you can do the one. As I said, there's a billion ways to make a million quid. So do both. Wow. So right now, I am just starting off with the hemp thing and kind of starting with the Bitcoin thing, but that's not, not I'm not really active on that. I'm more behind, kind of behind the scenes on that. Sure. I'm uh, doing those two. And today is what? 9th of October, 2018? Correct. See what happens a year from now, you know? We'll look back at this and think, ah, oh, yeah, how cool is that? So um, just coming back to the hemp thing then. Yeah. Um. What made you decide to go into that? Oh, sure. Now, this is interesting. This is like what I kind of consider the principles of business or principles of a healthy or profitable or well-oiled well business where you want a business where I say do the work once and get paid forever. Mm. Not do the work and then get paid and do the work and then get paid again. Do the work once, get paid forever. Mm. So you want to maximize that kind of like key – um, um, Key performance indicator as much as possible. Where do this thing because you know you know zero plus zero is going to be zero forever, but say one plus one is going to be two. But then it's like if you can do zero plus one could be two, zero plus two could be four, zero plus five could be six, for example. Where I'm doing the work once, I did it ages ago, so the, the input tomorrow next week is is less or the same as day one. But the income, the outflow, the result of that is exponentially higher because of the time being patient, the time being put into it, or the connections being, connections being built and established where people come to you asking for hemp. People come to you because like in the beginning, it's going to be hard. You're chasing customers. Mm. But once you've got good positioning, good reputation, good subscribers, good whatever the hell else, people will come to you saying, I want this, I want that, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. They'll come to you, but what effort did you put in? Well, Arguably, a year from now, you didn't put any effort in because on a day-to-day -day basis, you just pick up a phone. But from day one, you were doing a lot of effort. You were getting that engine started, getting the ball rolling. But once it's rolling, hell, it just cascades and people are attracted to it naturally. So I, I look for ways I can do the work once and get paid forever. Okay. The hemp thing is because it's just a brokerage. At the start, a lot of talking, a lot of connection building, email back and forth, phone calls, cold calls, or whatever else. Yes. But over time, Whatever, whatever time, because I'm planning on doing a podcast, planning on do, writing a book and a few other ideas, they'll come to me. Here's a product, call to action, cool. But, or, but it, hemp yeah. as a... But yeah. why, why hemp? Why oh, okay. not, uh, I don't know. Just, just pure coincidence. I heard about it years ago, thought that's an amazing product, underutilized. Right. Yeah. Tried something a year ago, I got a few books on it, tried to read, did a, did a bit of a crash course on that. Right. Um. I go to these networking events in London, but hemp, 
and just just coincidence. I mean, like I've met someone who who could supply me macadamia notes from Zimbabwe, mm. but I, I I don't know any macadamia factories in the UK. Could easily find them, mm. but I know he, I know someone else I could supply tobacco. Mm. It's just pure coincidence. Just I mean, it's, coincidence. it's it's an interesting product because I just looked it up on that on, on Ask Jeeves, <laughs> the free and the free and cl- NC Club. I can't even say it. Wikipedia, obviously, um, and it says there that it's it's grown specifically for the industrial uses of its derived products. Mm-hmm. It is one of the fastest growing plants and was one of the first plants to be spun into usable fiber 10,000 years ago. It can be refined into a variety of commercial items, including paper, textiles, clothing, biodegradable plastics. Now there's a there's one. That's a paint, naughty one. Paint, insulation, biofuel, as you said earlier, food and animal feed. Now the biodegradable plastics, that would be I mean, with all did you see the program last week about all the plastic in the in the seas and things? Um that's what we need, biodegradable plastics. There you go. That that's going to be a massive one. That's Wikipedia. That's on Wikipedia, yeah. Oh, interesting. We'll mm. check the references out as well for that. Interesting, to say the least. Mm. Um, so so yeah, you've picked on something that that I mean my wife and I were in Amsterdam a few weeks back and we were working walking along on the market and they're selling loads oh, several several stalls were selling rucksacks made from hemp interesting and they look really quite fashionable uh sending them for about quite expensive actually 25 euros uh for these bags i'm sure they made a lot cheaper and they're imported from abroad or somewhere but even so you know people have a um I know we're going off track a little bit, but it's interesting to explore it anyway, because it kind of confirms what you're saying. You know, if you pick on something that you can add value to in the supply chain, and I guess your value add is your mind, isn't it? It's you're not making cannabis, um, hemp, sorry, hemp, cannabis, whatever the plant you're not you're not making it you're not physically going to be farming it as such but you're using a mm-hmm. supplier and then you're adding your value add which is your mind yes and another key lesson you, you alluded to it very briefly just then is access not ownership i don't own the factory or mm. the farms or mm. the land mm. therefore i'm not responsible for anything i have no liability no wages, no utilities, no insurance, supplies, crops, things like that. Mm. But I'm accessing both. I'm accessing the farmers by doing a deal with them for them to agreeing to send their crop to the factory. Mm. And logistics, we can figure out some we can figure out ways or stuff like that. And I'm accessing the well I'm, not, I'm helping the the factory, but I'm I'm accessing the farm, but not owning anything. So access, not ownership, is something I'm also interested in where I have no liability, but I have all the potential, all the leverage, and all the profits. Mm. And that and means that, you can be uh, nimble and change yeah, <laughs> very quickly. Online. Yeah, yeah. Because all it is, therefore, I can do this in Gibraltar, in Marbella. I can mm. do this anywhere. Mm. I need a laptop, phone, VoIP, not much else. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Access no ownership. I'm not. I'm not tied down to any physical land or location, or any other paperwork or liability. Mm. like that. Yeah. Brilliant. So Love it. Do, do the work once, get paid forever. I think how the hell can I do whatever once and get paid forever? Very, very lev- good. Very smart. Very, a lot of leverage and access no ownership. Yeah. Own nothing, but access everything. Hmm. Hmm. Great. Wow. Okay, so that's so. So those are the two kind of business areas that you're involved with: the the kind of hemp and mm-hmm. the Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, which 
oh, that we could have lots of discussions about Bitcoin. The, the, what oh, people we might, but we won't. We won't for the purpose of this podcast because I wanted to really hear your story and where you were going in terms of because I mean, would so if you were to describe you and what you do, um, would you say you're an entrepreneur? Yes. 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 Because because you're going from because of the kind of little businesses that you've done, you're almost like going, right, I can do something in this business. Let me see if I can leverage that, make some money out of it, whether it was the gaming, then the potatoes, now it's the hemp, the Bitcoin. So you're just looking at opportunities and see how you can leverage it. And basically what you're saying is anybody could do exactly the same what you're doing. I am not a number. I am a free man. Mm. Yeah, love it. Brilliant. Wow. So a anything else, Adrian, that, that I've missed and haven't asked you that, that we should cover? Learn from your mistakes. Learn what you're doing wrong. Rationally think, what am I doing wrong? How can I improve? How can I be faster, quicker? How can I do it easier? How can I do it cheaper? Mm. And do you How, think don't don't go don't be a race to the bottom to be the cheapest have a race to the top to be the most exquisite most pristine, most pristine most professional most sought after mm. highest margins up there and, biggest fattest and if were are there some mistakes that you believe you've made along the way that you've learned from hmm <laughs> well loads uh I think because now they're all instinctive. Now they're not yes. as, not as easy to articulate. You just you just change over time. Uh, focus. What I decide to focus on because I got loads of ideas, but not all of them. I won't be doing the work once again. Paid Trevor. Uh, some of them access to ownership, which is good. But just very picky what I choose to work on. I think I look at something and think, well, is there a market already out there? Can I do it easily? Can I can I can I do it without? without too much effort on my behalf. Mm. Is it all from home? It was it leverage as much as possible. Can I start it for free or less than hundred pounds, which is actually very common, very easy as well. Um, how can I do this with, 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 uh, with no barrier to entry, no prior knowledge or no, no degree needed, anything like that, or, or as little as possible. That's what I look for now. That's, um, that's the biggest lesson. Be very picky in what you start. Cause the thing with the hemp, th not the, hemp the potato thing is, quite laborious um the the first video the first game i um first idea i had with the video games was brilliant because all it was is just emails back and forth to customers get the funnel sorted facebook adverts good copyright to the website call to actions good pricing people will buy it and it's sent to them automatically and the money gets deposited into paypal automatically mm. perfect that can be done and scaled and optimized anywhere but back then, I was so inexperienced, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Mm. So I think, <laughs> how can you... Yeah, it's that, it's that adage, work smart, not hard. But the yeah. question is, how, how, do you work, or how do you work smart? Well, among other things, access, access not ownership, do the work once, get paid forever. And I'm, I'm thinking of writing a book sometime. No, not a third book, not sure when, per se. Maybe 2019, no idea. got loads of notes for like all the things that I've learned and mistakes that I've made and a bit of an autobiography of the past few years. Um, cause I also find that we're writing, you shit, you put, you put your ideas down all the mistakes and lessons or, or pain from the past or whatever else. And you put it out into the world and it's out there. You kind of like a big chunk of you is like less burden, less burden on you. And it's like, it's out there and people can learn about it in their own pace or hear about it in general, but that's very low priority at the moment, but I got loads of ideas and notes for that. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like listening to you that you have got loads of ideas and thoughts about, you know, business opportunities and things. And I, I, and I think the word you just mentioned is focus because we can easily get distracted. And I, I admit that I've been over the years in running my own business, I've got distracted and, that, you know, somebody comes along with a nice shiny kind of new idea and you go, oh yeah, I, I can make money out of that or I'll go and join them and 
you know, mm. do something there and then it doesn't work out and you kind of go, why did I get distracted? Just keep focusing Raise on what I believe is the right thing. Raise your standards. Have a higher standard. Mm. Simple as that. Why find you- something that find that one thing that works. Scale it, exploit it, expand it, and then raise your standard. And why did I what? Why do you say raise your standard? Because if you fall, if it, if your standard is low enough, you'll do anything. You'll inadvertently waste your time. Uh, if you, if your standard is high enough, you'll be picky. Does this thing check a certain amount of tick boxes? Yes, it oh, does. Okay. I'll do it. It'll be worth my time, worth my energy. Networking events is a good example. I don't go to many of them. In fact, I've been invited to one in mid-october mm. and I got, I got a letter and a phone call about this left a few days ago a phone call today and i was looking through it and i was thinking well if i do this what's the opportunity cost what will i miss out on being able to do and what what can i really get out of this what can i gain opportunity cost is no, no i can make i can i can be more profitable doing something else yes and i can gain i can gain a lot out, out of the out of this but it's not really relevant to what i'm doing so therefore, it ticks those two boxes, or it doesn't tick those two boxes of, will I maximize my time and will I maximize what I'm going to learn? No, don't do it. So mm-hmm. I'm raising standard. Otherwise, I would have gone to it. I would have gone to loads of networking events all the time in Birmingham. But it's like, what do I get out of them? Nothing or pittance. So it's like, mm-hmm. it wasn't quite worth my time. Same with business, same with anything else. Do this or don't do that or go here or don't go there. Opportunity cost, essentially... What are you missing out on by being there? What could you do instead? Whatever it could be. Yeah. And what are you going to get out of it? Yeah. So raise your standard. Don't do this. No, no, because it means I'll be distracted from my goal, from my mission, Mm. from what I want to do, what I want to achieve, what I want to be known for. Mm. I think that's a very, very valid point. And you're right about the networking thing. People fill their time and get distracted. And I've done that over the years too. And I'm like you, I don't go to many now. Um, I I choose only, you know, a couple maybe at the most. And even then I don't go every single time. And, And I guess, you know, also we don't often have a plan for networking either. We don't, we don't have a plan to say, well, what do we want to get out of it? Or, if we meet somebody, you know, what what does that then mean? What how do we leverage or how do we help that person or what what's the purpose of us going to networking events? Because a lot of people go with the idea of I'm going to networking because I'm hoping I'm going to get some business out of it, which is actually the wrong idea. Um, because there are many other ways of getting business other than just going to networking events. And um, I heard somebody say a year ago or so saying that actually you should be thinking about when you, what are you going to learn by going to a networking event, you know, in terms of growing and understand, because you're like somebody who likes learning. So you're always going to learn something from the people that you meet or from hearing the speakers, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then again, how relevant would it be? How relevant, how, how applicable is it right now yeah. to you? Yeah. That's with a caveat. Yeah. Because you can learn right. all sorts of stuff. You can have an encyclopedia of knowledge, but only a couple of pages could be relevant to you and That's applicable. That's right. That's right. Otherwise, you're just wasting memory on the computer, hard drive, and gigabytes and terabytes and beyond. Mm. No, valid point. Adrian, I've, I've really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much. And if people wanted to connect with you and find out and read more about you and what you're up to, where, where can they do that? Oh, just check in the description box below. Nanchef.com is the biggest, yep. and globalhempexports.com. Okay, perfect. Nanchev, N-A-N-T-C-H-E-V.com. Perfect. Well, I'll include all of the links in the, in the show notes below, uh, and people can have a look at that. And I'm sure you and I are going to meet at a Tech Wednesday sometime in the future, um, or another event, and... Um, I really enjoyed speaking to you, Adrian. Have a fantastic day. You too. Awesome to chat. Cheers. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 